so I'm just recovering from laryngitis. Um, so apologies if my voice sounds a little bit off, and uh, I'll hopefully be able to uh, sustain it for the next 20 odd minutes. Um, Great, so as said, my, my name's Guy Anderson. I look after the uh, UK mid and, mid and small cap team at JP Morgan, and as part of that, um, I run the Mercantile Investment Trust, which is one of our investment trust vehicles. Um, what, what I'm actually going to talk about today is um, the current environment in which we're operating in the UK from an equity perspective, and then I'll talk more specifically about the mid cap market and why we think this is an interesting uh, part of the market in which to be invested, and then I'll touch briefly upon uh, mercantile specifically. Uh, so to start off, life post, post the Brexit vote. Um, if we, if we think, think back to uh, June of last year, um, we were clearly entering a period where there was a major decision that was going to be taken uh, by, by the U UK. And irrespective of one's uh, political or views or, or otherwise, one thing we do know about financial markets is that they don't reward uncertainty. Um, and, and based upon um, this chart on the left-hand side, which, which shows uh, UK economic policy uncertainty based upon uh, the number of times uh, policy uncertainty as a phrase is mentioned in uh, mainstream newspapers, uh, June 2016 uh, certainly marked a fairly high level of uncertainty. And of course, as we know, various uh, commentators were, were indicating that this presented a period of heightened risk, uh, and specifically within the UK, uh, if we think about uh, the all share or the FTSE 100, let's say, versus the mid cap part of the market, the area where I focus, uh, the mid cap part of the market is much more domestically exposed with, as you can see here at the time of the vote, um, close to 60% of the revenue sourced domestically. So based upon that, and based upon the outcome that, that, that we all know occurred, one would have expected a fairly turbulent time. However, the reality has been somewhat different from that. And as we know, there was a fairly immediate and, and, and sharp uh, sell down in the market over the first few days. But since then, we've been on a pretty tremendous recovery. So I, th I think really we need to understand what has driven that, um, and, and then maybe set the scene for, for where we are today. Um, so I think the first and, and probably most important factor has been, quite simply, the UK economy has been far more robust than many of the commentators and clearly all the economists expected. Um, so following the referendum, there was an immediate reduction in the expectations of economic growth that we would be delivered by the UK in 2017. So we can see prior to the vote, economists on average were expecting a bit north of 2% growth. Immediately post the vote, that was cut all the way down to 0.5%, um, which is a pretty drastic change in economic growth. Subsequent to that, we've seen as the economy has been consistently more robust than had been anticipated, those expectations have had to be continually revised upwards, such that we're looking today at around 1.5% GDP growth. So actually, expectations were very negative. The reality was actually clearly not quite as strong as had been expected beforehand, but actually continued economic growth. And of course, when we think about the UK market, and specifically, again, I'm talking about the mid-cap part of the market, yes, around 50% is is, 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 uh, represents revenue that is generated domestically, but of course, the, the, the other half is from internationally generated revenue. This chart on the right-hand side that I, I would pretty much ignore the numbers because they don't really mean anything, um, but what they do show is uh, the, the PMI, so the uh, Purchasing Managers Index, which is shown on a monthly basis across a range of geographies. And this shows the data over the last two years. A number north of 50 means expansion, essentially. And what we've shown in the color coordination is that red indicates likely contraction, green indicates expansion. And clearly what we can see is the color has generally gone increasingly greener as we've moved to the right. So what we're seeing, in other words, is synchronized global economic growth. And that is clearly of extremely relevant importance for this rather large section of the UK mid-cap market, which is exposed to international markets. So actually, yes, there's uncertainty, but the UK economy has been more robust than expected, and the international markets have been accelerating. But of course, from my perspective, the perspective of a, a UK mid-cap investor, 
we need to think about what are the opportunities uh, for the mid-cap market from here, given we've had such a good run and, and accepting a certain level of uncertainty. Excuse me. Um, so the first thing would be for us to look back over the performance of the UK mid-cap market over the, a fairly extended period of history. And here we show data um, taken from Numis, which shows the performance of the uh, NSCI 1000, which is the bottom 2% of the UK stock market, the NSCI, which is the bottom 10% of the stock market, and against the FTSE All Share. And this is data going back to 1955, so we've got 62, 63 years of history here. So re reasonably long-dated history. And, and for reference, NSCI, bottom 10% of the market, it's not dissimilar to the part of the market that we're looking at. And, and you may have noticed there is a log scale here. Um, so indeed, the bottom 2% of the market has generated a return of between 15 and 16,000% over that time period. Um, the bottom 10%, 6,500% versus the overall market, 1,000%. So we're talking pretty significant differences in returns over an extended period of time. Uh, to put it into context and to maybe make these numbers actually mean something, what that equates to, if you think about the bottom 10%, so that's 6,500% number versus the 1,000% number, that equates to about a 3% annual outperformance. Um, so something that's potentially easier to, to contextualize. Now, of course, the, the lower end of the market doesn't outperform every year, um, but over this time frame of, of 62 years, um, it has outperformed in two years out of three. So I think we call that sort of fairly persistent outperformance. What are the drivers of that? Is it just related to the history? Has something fundamentally been changed over the last 12 months, or is this something that's, that's likely to continue? Um, and certainly in our mind, there are a couple of drivers, and I'll, and I'll run through those in turn. So the first is investing in smaller businesses gives, gives in our mind, certainly us greater access to those businesses that are in, at an earlier stage in their business life cycle and thus able to generate super normal growth as opposed to growth that is inherently more linked uh, to the economies in which those businesses are operating. So, so of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back that up with, with an investment that happens to have worked, but, it, but it's still a valid example. Um, so we invested in Just Eat, which is, uh, I, I'm sure some, some of you may be users, uh, uh, an internet platform for uh, restaurants, well, uh, for takeaways. Um, and uh, we invested in this at its IPO, which was back in 2014. This was a point at which this was a real business that generated real cash flows and had tremendous growth and was clearly taking, taking advantage of a structural shift we were seeing in the way that people order their takeaways having gone from phone-based to internet-based. And over the last uh, three and a half years, I guess it is, they have more than tripled their sales. So I'm talking about the magnitude of sales growth that's possible from some of these younger businesses. And we've seen uh, reasonably decent share price performance alongside that, such that, that this business is now actually on the, on the cusp of the FTSE 100. So early stage of life cycle, we really think is crucial. The second area, and this, this is clearly more subjective, we do think smaller businesses are more, net, more nimble and therefore better able to adapt to change in industries and in the structure of industries. Um, so that could be uh, the advent of the internet. Clearly, that was a, a while ago now. Um, but that did change the way that the retail insurance brokerage market worked and allowed businesses such as Money Supermarket, which is the price comparison website, to really grow at the expense of the incumbents, so, so the existing uh, retail insurance brokerages. Changing consumer patterns and consumer behavior often presents uh, challenges, but also opportunities. And many people will be familiar with the rise of the discount retailers that we've experienced uh, in this country really over the last 10 to 15 years now. And, and B&M, this was a business that had, had just 20 outlets back in 2004. By the time it listed, which was uh, again in 2014, they'd grown to, uh, from memory, I think it was 385, but it was close to 400 outlets in the UK. Uh, and, and today they've got 550. And they have a strong advantage versus the incumbents because they provide limited assortment discount retailing, which means they stock a very narrow range of goods. So they have good depth of purchasing power at relatively small scale, and they provide consistent everyday value for money. And then regulatory change can, um, believe it or not, occasionally provide opportunities for businesses. And, and one of those is, is Mortgage Advice Bureau, which is one of the smaller companies in our portfolio, its market cap's only around 200, well, it's 260 million pounds, I think. 
Um, but this is a, a um, this is an intermediary network of mortgage brokers, and this is an area that has been growing tremendously since the mortgage market review a few years ago, where we've seen the big high street banks really step back from uh, distributing the mortgages uh, directly. So we think that is another interesting area um, for the mid cap market. Then the second key section is mergers and acquisitions. So what we refer to as, as, as M&A. Um, and this can come really from two directions. We can either own the companies that are acting as, as the purchasers, or we can own the companies which are themselves the targets. So if we think of, of the former first. So typically, most studies have shown that M&A doesn't add value. Most of those studies um, are, of course, centered on the S&P 500, which is looking at very large mergers. We're talking about relatively small businesses buying even smaller businesses, and there are some fairly crucial differences to that. So typically, our businesses that we're invested in, those that are active in M&A, will be acquiring much smaller businesses, often those that are owned by families where they're looking for a generational change, i.e. Re it's retirement planning, or there'll be businesses that are in a much smaller structure. And in those companies, um, value maximization upon day one, i.e. the transaction price, is not actually always the primary consideration. So it's actually possible by a good business at a sensible price where actually you're providing a home for that business and the employees. Um, the second point is smaller businesses tend to be less efficiently run, and so there should be greater opportunities um, to improve the uh, efficiency of the business and thus increase its value over time. And then, of course, the third point is, simply put, smaller businesses have a, a lower market impact, and so they're less likely uh, to receive the scrutiny of the the uh, Competition and Markets Authority, and so there's lower execution risk. So we quite like that side of the equation. The second side is as sellers. And um, if we look back at uh, data that goes back to 2000, so the last 15, 16 years, um, on average, 6% of the mid-cap market in any one year has been acquired, and that's versus 2% of the FTSE 100. That's not in itself very surprising. Of course, smaller companies, uh, as I've been explaining, are, are generally slightly higher growth, so they're more attractive in our minds. But also, of course, they're smaller, and therefore there's a wider range of potential acquirers. So they are more likely to be acquired. The UK specifically is a very attractive hunting ground for businesses because we have a completely open stock market. Stock market. We don't prevent businesses from being acquired. And then, of course, as I've mentioned, the, the, the smaller size. But if we think about the difference, 6% of the index in any one year versus 2%, and if on average we're selling our businesses at a 30% premium, because, of course, we don't agree to sell them at a price unless we think we're being paid more than tomorrow's price today. So that 30% premium on 6% of the index instead of 2% of the index equates to around 1.2% annual outperformance for mid-cap versus large-cap. So if you think of a 3% annual outperformance, that's 1.2% that really is quite clearly identified and, 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 uh, and likely to sustain through the cycle, et cetera. Um, another point, which isn't really about the companies, but more about the structure of the index, is that um, the FTSE 100 is a fairly concentrated index, as every, everyone, I'm sure, is very familiar with. Ten largest stocks make up 43% of, of that index. And so clearly, um, there's, there's a much, much greater amount of uh, idiosyncratic risk, so much greater stock-specific risk. Um, you know, if there's another uh, significant event in, in, a, in one of those big companies, it can have a big detrimental impact to the overall index. And the same is true, of course, from an income perspective. If we look at, um, I think it's the top, top five dividend payers, in fact, uh, in the FTSE 100, they make up 40% of the total income. So that dividend yield, 40% of that is just from five names whereas the equivalent numbers uh, for the FTSE 250, uh, the top five dividend pairs would make up just 12% of the total income. So in many ways, actually, investing in a broader and more diversified uh, index um, doesn't contain all of the risks that one might assume. So just briefly on to uh, the Mercantile Investment Trust. Um, so this is, um, in our minds, this is a liquid and cost-effective means of accessing the UK mid and small cap market, so both the mid cap and the small cap market. What we seek to achieve is long-term capital growth from a diversified portfolio of UK mid and small cap stocks. 
So we will operate with around 100 different investments at any one time. Um, and typically that will be split around 90% mid cap and around 10% small cap um, at any one point. In terms of, of the cost effective point, ongoing charges for mercantile, which is 48 basis points, so 0.48% um, to the year that ended uh, January just gone. And those are fees that are coming down by five basis points, uh, in fact, over the next year. So, so from, from February of next year, one would expect the ongoing fees clearly to be below and uh, 0.445%. In fact, that'll probably be 0.43 approximately. Um, in addition to targeting that long-term capital growth, uh, the investment trust pays out an income which is split quarterly. And the dividend to um, January of 2017 was 46p, which at the time equated to about a 2.6% yield. That's, that's about a 2.2% yield at, at today's share price. Um, as an investment trust, we can gear the portfolio or move into net cash um, we have a listed bond that, that was issued in 2000 that gives us that, that flexibility. And so at any single point in time, uh, we could be up to 20% geared. So clearly, we look to take advantage of a rising market. But then at, th at the same time, we can move into cash uh, if we're nervous about market levels and thus protect the absolute value of the capital. And as you can see, uh, you can see on the right-hand side um, the performance record over, over various time frames. Um, so what it is we actually do, I've talked quite a lot about the market in which we're investing, um, but how do we identify the attractive securities within that market specifically? Well, it's not quite as simple as it's laid out on the screen, but what we generally try to do is look for stocks that have one or more of three key characteristics. So of course, we're looking for attractively valued securities, and we'll look at a whole range of absolute and relative valuation measures. Uh, most critically, of course, we focus on the cash flow. Um, we look for businesses that are cash generative, generative and that we will do something with the cash that those businesses generate. Um, so I think an interesting example of that is DS Smith. This is a, you know, essentially a business that manufactures card cardboard packaging. So this is not a very exciting business. But actually, therein lies the opportunity because it's seen as a very cyclical business, but it is a business that has structurally changed uh, many aspects of how they operate in that they're, they're, they're very exposed to um, what's called retail-ready packaging, which is the packaging you'd see in a supermarket. Uh, if you walk down the aisle and buy some Oreo cookies, they'll probably be in a clever little box that someone has just put in and ripped off the, the, the lid, and it's all ready-made uh, for display. And that's a category that's growing at about 10% per year. And then, of course, I'm sure a few people uh, buy things that get delivered to their homes in brown, brown, brown cobble boxes, and, and D.S. Smith have a reason about of exposure to that. And this is a business that's viewed as cyclical. It is cyclical, undoubtedly, but has various good growth levers to it. And it's valued at a, at a reasonable discount to the market and uh, a reasonably healthy sort of six plus percent um, free cash flow yield. We also look for businesses which, you know, we've rather blandly put, have solid fundamentals. But clearly, we're looking for businesses that have that strong competitive positioning that was talked about um, earlier. We're looking for the sustainability of the earnings, businesses that are profitable. And then crucially, businesses that generate cash and then do something sensible with the cash, i.e. We, we, we meet a lot of management teams and we're looking to invest in those businesses where they reinvest that cash in um, good investments with high returns. And I think a good example of that is uh, Bellway, the regional house builder, which has a very flexible capital allocation policy. So where they see good land opportunities, they'll buy the land in order to continue growing the business. Where they don't see those opportunities, they'll return the cash to shareholders. And they haven't forced themselves into being either one of the growing house builders or one of the cash returns house builders. So the management have the flexibility to do what's right, as opposed to what they've already said they will do. And then the third thing, which is possibly the most important thing that we're looking for, is businesses that are either approaching or undergoing some form of positive change. And that could be a, a management-led restructuring, it could be a cyclical turning point, or it could simply be a business that has unappreciated growth momentum. Um, so one of our key focuses really is on identifying those periods of change. Um, and, a, and an example of that that's in our portfolio would be Body Coat. This is an industrial engineer that heat treats metal uh, to improve its properties and is used in a whole range of uh, industrial uh, applications and that is benefiting from growing industrial production that we're seeing uh, across the across the world over the over the last year. 
as you can see, that, that, that investment process has translated into um, the returns that you can see on, on the screen here. We've shown here uh, the returns for the last five years, which, which actually roughly translates um, to the period in which uh, I have been involved in the portfolio. Um, but just jumping forwards, I'm going to try and actually finish on exactly uh, within my 20 minutes. Um, so in summary, I think the most important thing actually is that the UK mid and small cap universe is a lot more than the UK PLC. There is a lot of negative sentiment in the press at the moment, but I think it's very important um, that we focus, particularly as investors, we focus on the reality on the ground for our companies rather than the hyperbole that we can see if we read uh, pretty much any forms of press. Uh, I, I think there are compelling drivers of long-term outperformance for the UK mid and small cap equity market. And that uh, hopefully uh, the specialist team um, that I look after uh, will have continued success in, in identifying those specific companies that are most likely uh, to win. And, and clearly in a, a diversified universe of, of stocks that we think is very, very exciting. Thank you.